Boa tarde a todas, a todos novamente. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, following the fruitful and stimulating morning activities we had, and also, I hope, by stimulating lunch, we opened the second part of our seminar with a talk by my scholars entitled Gender Responsive Pedagogy in Higher Education a framework to support lecturers and their students to become gender responsive professionals. Uh, a commentary on the conference by mine will be provided by our colleague, Carla Cepeda. Before I briefly introduce our speakers, I would like to express on behalf of the Engender team our gratitude to Mai and Carla for being here with us today in Conigra sharing their vast experience in efforts to promote gender equality and also for offering such important contributions to our center. Aware of the time and the logistical difficulties that are involved in traveling from Oxford to Coimbra, I would like to thank my sponsor in particular, not only for her efforts to be here with us today, but also for her generosity and kindness with which she has graced us from the time we invited her to participate in our seminar. Uh, we are very grateful for her presence and look forward to what will, without a doubt, be a very insightful and enriching conference for all of us. Uh, so I'm going to read briefly some introductions. Uh, Mike Scottgar works as a program specialist on gender at INEX, International Network for Advancing Science and Policy, based in Oxford, the UK. Uh, INES supports other individuals and institutions to produce, share, and use research and knowledge. My focus is on gender responsive programming and pedagogy, as well as individual and organizational capacity building. She is an experienced project manager, facilitator, and trainer. My managed the project Transforming Employability for Social Change in East Africa which supported universities, industries, communities, and government to work together to create an improved learning experience for students, both women and men, focusing on teaching for critical thinking and problem solving. My co-designed the project's approach to gender-responsive pedagogy and then supervised the delivery of this approach to 594 lectures in East and West Africa. Since 2022, she has been managing the project Global Platforms for Equitable Knowledge Ecosystems. My holds a master's in international studies from Aarhus University in Denmark. Mai has also co-authored several publications focused on promoting more gender-responsive pedagogical practices, including Integrating Gender-Responsive Pedagogy into Higher Education, published in 2020 by INASP, and How to Make University Classes More Gender Responsive, also published in 2020. Our commentator, Carla Cerqueira, holds a PhD in Communication Sciences, specialization in Communication Psychology, from the University of Mio, funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, FCT. From February 2019 to August 2020, she was a full-time researcher at the Communication and Society Research Center, SESH. And currently, she is an associate professor at Lusofana University and a researcher at CITANCH, the Center for Research in Applied Communication, Culture, and New Technologies. Her research interests include gender, feminism, intersectionality, NGOs, and media studies. Carla Cerqueira integrates the board of APEN, the Portuguese Association for Women's Studies, and she's part of the RTP's Opinion Council as a member appointed by the NGOs to the Advisory Council of the Co Commission for Citizenship and Gender Equality C. She is currently PI of the research project Fem Local, Local Feminist Movements, Interactions and Contradictions, also funded by FCT. So after these not so brief introductions, <laughs> I will, without any further delays, give the floor to our speaker, Mai Spocker. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for having me here and for inviting me here. 
so, um, as the introduction uh, sort of already made clear, I'm going to talk about a framework uh, for gender responsive pedagogy in higher education uh, that INAS uh, co developed with partners in a project called Transforming Employability for Social Change in East Africa. That's shortened to TESIA, so I'm going to be saying that a lot because otherwise I can spend all of my talk just <laughs> saying the full project name. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly introduce you to that project and then we'll move on to uh, looking at uh, the framework that we've uh, created for gender responsive pedagogy, specifically in higher education, uh, and some of the results uh, from that project where we implemented the framework. Before we start with that though, uh, I have a riddle that I'm going to project up here and that I'm just going to give you uh, half a minute to reflect on and then we can see if we can come back to it at the end of this time. Um, so this is the riddle. Uh, a middle-aged businessman is walking back to his office in the central business district of Nairobi one day after having lunch. While walking, he sees an old friend of his whom he's not met in many years walking towards him, accompanied by a young girl. They meet and they greet each other warmly. The old friend says to the businessman, since we met, last met, I married someone that you have never met. This is our daughter, Maya. The businessman greets Maya and says, Maya, it's nice to meet you. You look just like your mother. So the riddle is, how does the businessman know this? How does the businessman know that Maya looks just like her mother. That's easy. That's good. It's, it's not always easy. For a lot of people, it's not always easy, this riddle. Uh, so this is a riddle that we've used in some of our work with lecturers to help make clear where there can be gender bias uh, and sort of uh, highlight some of the issues around gender. Uh, and quite often it's not easy for people. Uh, and we get people giving us all sorts of very complicated explanations <laughs> rather than the more straightforward <laughs> explanation. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, our approach to gender responsive pedagogy uh, in higher education came from the TESIA project. Uh, and that project helped young people in Tanzania and Uganda to use their skills and ideas to tackle social and economic uh, problems. It was a project uh, that lasted for three and a half years, and we had four universities that we were working in, two universities in Tanzania and two universities in Uganda, and then there were also three uh, project support partners. So in us in the UK, which is I, where I'm from, so we managed the project and we also provided uh, pedagogical expertise. Uh, and then we had two organizations in Kenya, um, the Association for Faculty Enrichment in, in Teaching and Learning. AFL in Kenya, they also provided uh, pedagogical expertise. And then we worked with Ashoka East Africa. Uh, and Ashoka focuses on social entrepreneurship, uh, so they brought that into uh, the work that we did. And as uh, was mentioned, uh, the project aims was to transform uh, teaching and learning in the four universities. So the focus was on working with lecturers to redesign the way that they teach, they teach their courses, focusing on teaching for critical thinking and problem solving skills, so soft <coughs> skills. And uh, within that also uh, embed gender responsive pedagogy in order to ensure that both uh, women and men students would benefit equally from this transformed um, teaching and learning experience. And beyond that, so we work in depth with these four universities and what we also try to do while improving teaching and learning specifically in those four universities was to develop a model and, and tools that could be taken up by others and scale so that uh, hopefully uh, in this next phase uh, that we are currently trying to raise funding for we would like to scale to even more universities uh, so that we can have a greater impact. So uh, as I said, uh, the project focused on uh, redesigning teaching and learning. So we had a redesign learning journey that uh, we took the lecturers through. Uh, there were four steps on this uh, learning journey. So first, uh, we had a workshop around program alignment, which uh, focused on profiling the ideal graduates. So thinking about what are the skills and attributes and competences that any graduate from the respective university should graduate with. 
Uh, for some of the universities, they actually uh, included gender responsiveness in that, so that was a way of embedding gender responsiveness from the beginning. Uh, then we looked at transformative learning, so this was changing the mindset around how teaching and learning um, takes place, uh, shifting the emphasis uh, away from the lecturer, being the sage on the stage, to uh, student-centered learning and making sure that students were an active part in the teaching and learning experience. Uh, and then there was a, a course redesign where lecturers then started to look specifically at their courses, how could they redesign these courses in order to uh, embed critical thinking and problem solving skills and also gender responsiveness. And then the final stage was learning design, which moved from uh, lecturers working at a course level to working specifically with one lesson or learning episode. So what uh, were they going to do specifically differently uh, when, when they were in the classroom? So looking really at a lesson and what they were going to do uh, as part of that. And uh, what we did uh, with TESIA was we started at the course level. So we worked in depth with three to four programs at these universities, but we worked on specific courses. So the idea with that was uh, rather than uh, redesigning an entire course, which can take a long time, and then you have a long time where you're just redesigning before lecturers are actually in the classroom te teaching uh, the redesigned course, we focused on the course level. So by doing that, lecturers would redesign their course and then they would almost immediately go into the classroom and teach their redesigned course and they would get feedback from students and then they could uh, make adjustments and improve. Uh, so that was the idea of working uh, at the course level. Um, and uh, throughout uh, this learn redesign learning journey, we then embedded gender responsive pedagogy uh, so that we had those considerations throughout. Um, I'm sure this probably uh, isn't new to many of you, uh, but the reason why we decided that gender responsive pedagogy was important and why gender matters in pedagogy uh, is because there have been studies, specifically studies uh, in uh, Africa uh, and in the countries where we were implementing TESIA, uh, that have shown that gender insensitive pedagogical processes and biases against women's academic and intellectual abilities are, uh, are barriers to gender equality uh, in higher education. And also, uh, quite often, female students' achievements, although they are at a general level um, equal to those uh, of uh, male students, sometimes even better, they are often considered to be ill-deserved, and uh, particularly in Africa, there's this idea of sex for grades. So if a female student gets good grades, it's probably because she's had a sexual uh, relationship with her lecturer. Um, and there's actually a very interesting documentary from uh, BBC Africa looking at some of these practices in Ghana and Nigeria because uh, lecturers also take advantage of this. Uh, so, but that often means that if a, a woman is doing well in um, university in Africa, or at least it can be, uh, that then it might just be seen that that's because she's had a sexual relation with her lecturer and that's a way of talking down women's achievements because they're not because of their intellectual abilities, it's because of other things. Um, and so when gender becomes a pivotal lens within pedagogy, it supports more inclusive and interactive, uh, interactive teaching and learning practices that can balance both women's and men's participation. So, so this was uh, really our goal with gender responsive uh, pedagogy. And obviously also it's important uh, because uh, higher education is where future professionals and researchers are trained. Uh, and so if women are not able to succeed within higher education, then they will not be able to participate in that and help generate knowledge for society, which is very important. Uh, so when we started uh, to look at gender responsive pedagogy, and particularly for this project where we were working in East Africa, uh, we, we tried uh, to see what, what was already there that we could build on, uh, and we found that there was quite a bit of work that had been done on gender responsive pedagogy in primary education and secondary education. There wasn't that much that had been done in higher education, and what we could find was mainly from uh, the global north, and we knew that we were implementing this project in East Africa, so we wanted to make sure that we could find something that would work in that uh, context. 
Um, so one of the things that we did build on uh, is some work that the Forum uh, for African Women Educationalists, FAWE, have done. Uh, particularly, they had a toolkit for gender responsive pedagogy in secondary education that we use. And so uh, we sort of base a lot of uh, our practices around their uh, concept of pedagogy and gender responsive pedagogy. So that's what's on the slide here. <coughs> Uh, and Farway defines gender responsive pedagogy as teaching and learning processes that pay attention to the specific learning needs of uh, female students and male students. So uh, we took that as our starting point, uh, but what, what we then did uh, was uh, we, we sort of built on that to create our own definition of gender responsive pedagogy and we made our definition uh, two pronged. So, building on Farway, the learning needs of male and female learners are addressed in teaching and learning processes. It was important for us that that's both inside and outside of the classroom. So, uh, what <coughs> students learn through their experience in higher education does not only happen in the classroom, it's also everything else. Uh, and then the sort of uh, second uh, prong to our definition is uh, teaching staff are gender aware and gender responsive in their planning and facilitation of courses and they're continuously reflecting and adapting. So we thought it was important not just to focus on the students, but also what needs to happen with the teaching staff uh, in order to be able to actually uh, implement gender responsive pedagogy. Uh, and what we then uh, did was sort of look uh, at the literature uh, along with uh, a gender expert that helped us with this. So how, how can we actually then think about teaching and learning um, and, and gender responsive pedagogy within that, uh, and not just looking at the content that is being taught, but everything else that goes along with teaching and learning. Um, so based on that, uh, we have designed a framework. Hopefully you can see it here. So what we have is an outer ring of seven orange boxes, which are seven uh, teaching and learning spaces. So we have teaching and learning materials, so that's the content. We have classroom interactions, classroom management and setup, language, learning spaces and campus life. We have assessment, and then we have teaching and learning methodologies and activities. So these are seven aspects of uh, teaching and learning and pedagogy that we think it's important to reflect on uh, in terms of gender. And then in the inner circle, we have six green triangles and they are then six dimensions of gender that play into each of these uh, seven teaching and learning spaces. So we have representation as one dimension of gender, then we have equality, equity as uh, another dimension of gender, we have stereotypes, internalized bias, interactions and space, and then we have power and empowerment. So the idea with this framework is uh, sort of to give lecturers a tool that they can use to reflect on how these six dimensions of gender play out in each of these seven teaching and learning spaces. Uh, so we're not, when, when we train uh, the lecturers, we don't train them specifically in what to do because they will know that best uh, in, in their course and in their context, but we give them the tools to reflect on how these six dimensions of gender play out in these seven teaching and learning spaces. Uh, so for instance, uh, if we think about the dimension of representation as a dimension of gender, that can include looking at the promotional materials for the university. Uh, is there equal representation of women and men in those materials? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, if, if there isn't for prospective students in terms of how they might see themselves at that institution. It could be looking at uh, the language that's being used in the, in the class. Uh, is there representation there? Um, and it can also involve looking at teaching and learning materials and how representation plays out in the teaching and learning materials. If you look at uh, equality and equity as a dimension of gender, uh, that can be looking at uh, the gendered nature of subject choices quite of, often, and so, so who are the students that you actually have in your class that will quite often depend on the subject uh, choice. It's also looking at classroom setup and management and how interactions happen within the classroom. Does that promote equality uh, and equity or not? Uh, so sometimes you will find if you have, uh, often in some of these universities um, in, in Africa, 
they, they have uh, huge student bodies and so they will have these big, big lecture halls. Uh, and if you have uh, specific uh, subjects where you might not have that many women students, they tend to sit in the back. And so what does that mean for equality and equity within the classroom if the, the women students are in the back and they can't participate in the same way as the men students? Um, it can also be looking at if you do group work, who takes on what types of roles within group work. Is it always uh, the men students that become the group leaders that stand up and present afterwards and maybe the women students that take the notes? So what can we do to try and shift that? Um, so that's one way uh, of looking at it. Um, and then uh, stereotypes uh, and bias, uh, specifically that can also be about linking uh, the content in the class uh, to the world of work. And so how, how does a stereotype and biases play out uh, in the content, in, in the teaching and learning situation, but also in the professional fields that the students might uh, go into. Uh, and so trying to think about how that can be addressed um, in the teaching and learning space. Um, and then um, interactions and, and space, again, is about, around what happens in the classroom, um, in the teaching and learning methodologies and activities. Also, uh, campus life, so who has access to what parts of the campus, uh, can there be restrictions? So we did some work with um, the University of Dodoma where they actually found uh, that quite often, uh, once it got dark, women students stop moving around because they have a huge campus uh, that's in a vast space and it wasn't safe for women students to move from one area of the university to the other. So that could restrict their access to the library during the evening, for instance, because they couldn't actually go there because it wasn't safe. So they, they put up uh, street lights and they started implementing buses that could uh, take the students from one place to the other so that there was equal access. Uh, and then finally, uh, power and empowerment. That's thinking about sort of uh, obviously power but also knowledge and how knowledge flows from the lecture to the students but also from the students to the lecture between the lecture and the institution and the institution and the lecture. So it doesn't just flow in one direction, but it sort of flows uh, in multiple directions uh, and thinking through that. Uh, so uh, when we were doing uh, the redesign that we did in Tessia, we then had some questions that uh, lecturers were asking themselves as they were redesigning their courses and re that they were reflecting on so that they could integrate that into their teaching and learning. Uh, so that was, what are the gender inequalities that exist in your country? How do these inequalities affect your students? And are there differences between uh, men and women students in your department or in your institution? Do your course materials and te teaching styles reproduce any of these social inequalities? And if so, what can you do differently to challenge and transform the gender inequalities? How can you be open to discussions about gender in your classroom? So that's sort of a very important element, is just opening up this space to have these discussions and have these reflections. Um, how does gender affect the different kinds of support that uh, male and female students might need? Uh, and do you need to do anything uh, specifically to address some of those needs? Uh, and how can you, as a higher education practitioner, encourage your students to be more aware and responsive to gender discrimination in their future work? place um, and in interactions that might happen in the future workplace. Um, so that's sort of, if we go back to the, to the framework, so we have these uh, seven teaching and learning spaces and we have the six dimensions of gender, but what we also have in here in the middle uh, is gender aware, which uh, was an important starting point for us, that the lecturers need to be gender aware before they can actually start implementing this. So that's a very important aspect of the framework. Uh, and then also because this, uh, we designed this specifically for higher education, uh, we thought it was very important to have this element uh, of lecturers becoming gender responsive professionals, but also students when they graduate. So it's not just thinking about the lecturers, but also if you can actually implement gender and be, be gender responsive in your pedagogy, then that will have an impact on your students when they graduate. Uh, so if we look uh, at that again a bit more, uh, so students uh, as future gender responsive uh, professionals, um, that included sort of uh, having a focus on the attributes of a gender champion. So if, if we want the lecturers to be gender champions, but we also ideally want the students to be gender champions. 
what are then some of the attributes that we have to inculcate in our students? So that could be integrity, self-responsibility, social awareness. <coughs> there are many different attributes. We're starting to think about those. Uh, and then also make sure that the lecturers actively discuss and prepare the students for a gendered world of work. So we know that once students leave higher education, they will go into a gendered uh, world. So what, what can we do to prepare them for that, but also make sure that they can go out and be change agents uh, when they go out. So that's thinking about what their workplace will look like, what will be the demographics of that workplace be like. Will it be heavily skewed towards women, maybe in some professions, men in other professions, what does that mean for your students when they go into those professions? Uh, are there any safety considerations uh, to think about in terms of the workplace and in terms of women and men? And what are the gendered situations that they might encounter once they go uh, into the workplace? How can we better pre prepare them for that, but also prepare them uh, to challenge those uh, gendered situations so that they can start to affect change? Uh, and then, I, as I mentioned, uh, the other important element for us here uh, was that lecturers need to be gender aware before you can really start. So that's sort of the first step in this uh, process. Um, and for that, we use a toolkit that we've developed previously from another, from another project that's around uh, gender mainstreaming in higher education. Uh, so this toolkit was uh, co-developed in 2016 with the University of Dodoma. Uh, they were also a partner in the Tesla project uh, and a gender consultant called uh, Sue Goliver. Uh, and so uh, this has been designed specifically for uh, institutions in low resource countries that want to mainstream gender. So it's, it's a start of the conversation, uh, this toolkit. So it introduces the first introductory workshop uh, that can be held to create uh, gender awareness and also to start uh, putting together an action plan for how we might uh, mainstream gender in the institution. So we use the part of this toolkit that's about creating gender awareness. So that uh, involves a sort of defining gender concepts. So until we know uh, what we mean when we use all of these concepts, we can't really start to work with it. Uh, exploring what gender mainstreaming means and then also very importantly is understanding the current context of gender uh, in higher education both globally and nationally, because it's important to understand the situation in the country uh, that you're in, but also be able to compare that uh, with what's going on in the world. Um, and so we use uh, that part of the toolkit um, for, for Tessia to create that gender awareness uh, among uh, the lecturers. So uh, if we look at some of the results uh, from this work, uh, so when we started the project, uh, we did a baseline measurement of the lecturers to see where they were at in terms of teaching for critical thinking and problem solving skills and also uh, knowledge and practices around gender responsive pedagogy. And then we repeated that um, survey at the end of the project. Uh, and what we found with that was that there was a marked shift in perceptions of lecturers uh, towards a greater consciousness and practice in favour of gender equality. Uh, so they had started to really take uh, this on board and they started to shift uh, their practice and also their perceptions. Uh, so it started a, a very important sort of first um, awareness race, raising and sort of uh, starting to then think about the practice. Uh, and some of the changes that we saw in practices, uh, so at the end of the project, 71% of the lecturers uh, developed gender responsive teaching and learning materials and that had gone up from 25%. Uh, at the beginning of the project. 83% organized their classroom to be gender responsive, that had gone up from 33%. 80% uh, guided the use of gender appropriate language, that had gone up from 45%. Uh, and 76% transformed biased messages in teaching and uh, teaching materials into positive content. 47% set uh, assignments that demand that the students think about uh, the gender dimension of a particular. Uh, topic. Uh, and what we found uh, along with this is that s some of this takes work and create, can require a lot of work, particularly if you're trying to change uh, your teaching and learning materials, for instance, because quite often that's just content you're given and that's what you have to teach. But we found that there were some quick wins and easy entry points when looking at gender responsive pedagogy along with these uh, seven teaching and learning spaces. So classroom management and interactions was something where lecturers could actually go in and start to make change uh, without a lot of 
uh, sort of uh, preparation other than being aware of these things uh, and having been trained in this. And language was another thing where we saw that, again, once you've become aware, you can start to think about the language that you use in class. So these were the two that came up as sort of they are quick wins and easy um, entry points where lecturers can start to make changes almost immediately. Uh, and so I have a couple of quotes here from some of the lecturers. Uh, so the language I use in class is inclusive. The examples I use are inclusive and using a language that uplifts both male and female students. <coughs> so that's an example of how language can change. Uh, and then uh, I consider gender issues from the first level of lesson preparation, class implementations, assessment, class examples, classroom setting plan, and even uh, representativeness. So this is a nice sort of an example of how this sort of framework and thinking through all of these different elements means that you can then actually integrate gender in lots of different places in your teaching and learning practice. If we look at the results for uh, students. Um, it's uh, still early days and unfortunately within the time span of the project uh, we weren't able to follow students through to graduation so we don't know what's happened to the students after they've uh, graduated. But we did see some positive uh, shifts in their behaviour and attitude as well. And our evaluation of the project found that the gender responsive design of Tessia contributed to creating students who are active learners not intimidated to interact with their fellow students, their teachers, or assume more confident roles in class. Uh, and we saw increased levels of gender interaction, so male and female students interacting with each other more than they did previously, uh, and also awareness raising in classroom settings. So some of the lecturers told us uh, that they had an active conversation with their students about gender, uh, and that actually meant that the students would then also, if the lecturers were using it, gender insensitive language, the students would point that out and sort of the students and lecturers would help each other and learn together uh, to make uh, the class more gender responsive. What we also found particularly was that some female students and some lecturers of female students have expressed how they've grown in confidence and how they've been given a voice that they didn't feel like they had before. So again I have a quote here uh, from uh, a lecturer at Mississippi University. My class had some learners who couldn't easily interact with another gender. Both females and males had this kind of learners. However, females were more, most affected. I made efforts to make them interact in discussion and leading uh, of the discussions. The strategy showed improvement. The introspective learners became active and can interact with both genders. The most interesting is the growth of con confidence when contributing. Uh, hopefully this can help learners uh, in not only the learning environment, but in their job and back to the families. So this is also an, an example of, uh, at least I think for me, how gender responsive pedagogy is, can actually have an effect beyond maybe just uplifting the women students, but actually all of the sort of um, more introspective learners, irregardless of their gender. Uh, and, and obviously also that's also partly uh, the focus on student-centered learning that we had in this project uh, when you start to interact with students more. Uh, and then we have female students from the, from the University of Dodoma um, and she said, I now have a new life experience in academics. As a female student, I did not play any leadership role in my class. I was taught to respect and obey what my teachers taught me, whether correct or wrong. I now have learned how to say no, discuss, disagree and to compromise on issues that affect society in general. I think I've gained some form of personal freedom and the willingness to lead. So that's an example of how it can really have an impact uh, on women students in particular. Uh, I have a couple of more slides and then I, I'll <laughs> finish. Uh, so uh, what we also saw uh, as part of the results uh, were in terms of institutional change. So what we did in Tessier was we used gender responsive pedagogy as a starting point for wider conversations within the institutions uh, about how they can make uh, changes to their institutional policy, processes and practice and uh, in order to uh, ensure more inclusive learning. 
so uh, in the past when we've done gender mainstreaming work, it was looking at uh, policies a lot and practices within the institution, which, which is very important. But we actually found through Tessia that gender responsive pedagogy became an interesting jumping off point for having those conversations when you start to look at the practice before you start to look at some of the policy issues. Um, and so again, I have a couple of quotes. Uh, so uh, this is from the U University of Doma, where we've done work with our gender mainstreaming toolkit previously to the Tessier project. Uh, and um, one of the lecturers there said, the university has a gender policy, so this was developed through a gender mainstreaming work with them. But before uh, Tessier was introduced, the policy was dormant. Uh, now, uh, thank you to Tessia, the university has gone further, uh, introducing action plans and affirmative actions to improve gender equality. Uh, so this is sort of an example of uh, policies are very important, but you need to do something with those policies uh, in order for change to actually happen. Uh, and uh, a senior leader at Uganda Martyrs University that we also work with uh, said we're putting up structures uh, through which voices can be uh, challenged uh, can be channeled from uh, the excluded groups at the university. So again, that's sort of showing how uh, a thought, a sort of gender responsive pedagogy was the entry point, but they also started to, to, to think about excluded groups more widely and not just <coughs> uh, So finally, uh, in terms of learning uh, about the approach, uh, gender responsive teaching, uh, for us became an entry point for wider institutional change and it was actually quite an interesting uh, entry point because what we found was that the lecturers we worked with had a unique position uh, because they could influence upwards with university management and that sort of became uh, the key for institutional policy uh, change but they, they can also influence uh, down in terms of the students and then the students can become uh, important advocates for institutional change as well uh, and lectures are kind of sat uh, in a great spot in the middle there because uh, they have uh, links both upwards and downwards. Uh, what we found in Tessia in, in order for um, uh, this to be successful was that our approach uh, had to be uh, multi-angled uh, so uh, we worked with lecturers and we did what we call training of trainers. So that was training gen gender champions at each of the universities that could then help spread this uh, throughout their university. Uh, in Tesco, uh, they called themselves multipliers because they saw that as their role was to multiply the approach. Uh, leadership buy-in is, is very important. Uh, and uh, you don't necessarily need to have this from the beginning, we found, uh, but then you need very strong people in the institution that can then advocate with leadership so that you get leadership by it uh, eventually. Uh, and then what we also found uh, that was sort of very important is just to open up the space uh, for dialogue. So what we had within the project team was a gender working group with members uh, of all project partners uh, and we then came up with this approach uh, together and that was very important to have all of those uh, voices uh, included. Uh, and so just a final quote uh, from um, a female professor at Gulu University. Before gender mainstreaming was considered a small unit under the academic register and was mainly concerned with admission <coughs> issues. However, with the Tessier project, the university has realized that gender encompasses more than admission and requires special attention. Gulu University is now in the process of appointing an officer to take full responsibility for this. The gender policy, anti-sexual harassment policies, safeguarding policies, and whistleblowing policies are all likely to be handled by this unit. So again, this is sort of showing how this awareness around gender can bring attention to the fact that it's not just looking um, at, at who's admit, admitted to the university, but you have to have a much more holistic approach. That's it. That's the next
to be here today and of course I want to congratulate the project for your first results um, at this point. And uh, of course I want to thank Mike uh, for the, the inspiring project that uh, shared today with us and uh, this clear and fruitful presentation. I have here some notes. Uh, I will follow because I have a few time uh, to comment the presentation and uh, today my comments come, come very much from my reflection about the inclusion or the lack of exclusion of the gender perspective in higher education degrees in the Portuguese context, mainly in communication field. Uh, and of course uh, my experience as a researcher but also as a teacher and a trainer in this context. And of course um, uh, I have been involved in the last year mainly uh, in the implementation of the Equality and Diversity Plan in my university and we have also this kind of discussions and I think they uh, are uh, here present in some uh, topics. Uh, in my perspective, there are several uh, reflections suggested by this presentation and uh, um, I'm going to focus uh, my intervention on, on some concerns I have in this field and some questions um, that I think allow us to think together about uh, the way forward to implement changes in this uh, specific context. Uh, and uh, when I saw the title of your uh, presentation, I immediately thought of the structural change it implies. Uh, a change uh, in pedagogical practices, in the way gender dimension is included in professional daily life, in the way uh, of teaching in the contents, uh, in the relationship established with the students, and of course with all the structure, with the colleagues, with all the structure. Here um, we see pedagogy as a concept that embraces teaching and learning processes. Within the context of the classroom, pedagogy is a term that includes contents, teaching processes and methods. Uh, and from my point of view, in, uh, it is an approach who places great value uh, in listening and voice. Um, and also in uh, interpersonal communication and, and of course horizontal and bidirectional communication. I think, and today we saw some <coughs> examples uh, from that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it also seems to me that this gender uh, sensitive pedagogical approach refers to how can higher education become a locus of citizenship and promotion of equality, equity and diversity. Uh, and when we talked about res results, we saw, for example, and today for me it was very clear, the importance of the impact evaluation of these projects. Um, and sometimes we feel that we don't pay attention to these impacts and we don't monitorize this kind of projects. Uh, the literature in the field shows that the inclusion of the gender and diversity approach in curriculum, especially in a, um, first uh, cycle higher education courses, is still scarce and non-existent, and today we saw the results from an engender project here. Um, and uh, we uh, see lots of barriers in this case. So, um, in your expertise, maybe you can explore more these barriers uh, during the, the process. Um, what are the biggest barriers in this implementation process? Um, if it is easier to create this gender war that you mentioned today um, from your framework. And in fact, I remember uh, Sarah Ahmed's work um, that observed the gap between official diversity speak and the performative dimensions of equity and the diversity work and the realities of institutional constraints. Uh, in your case, the approach was applied and pro proved to be successful. You have four uh, institutions. Um, but how uh, do you overcome these barriers to achieve the operationalization? Um, and simultaneously, I wish you could explore further how critical thinking because uh, is uh, operationalized during this process 
um, what strategies are used because um, you give uh, um, if you could give some examples because I think uh, critical thinking as a process as a methodology uh, is essential here in this project is essential uh, inside the classroom and of course outside and in the, the higher education process. Uh, what I feel especially from other <coughs> graduate courses uh, is that we need to work more uh, on other content, for example, and platforms, and what kind of tools you use uh, during the process. Because, for example, from my experience, um, students pay a lot of attention to social media, for example. Um, of course, I am from communication field, but uh, all students pay attention to this social um, media and networks uh, and uh, at the same time it seems worrying to hear that they use more and more platforms like TikTok and we were talking about that during the lunch today um, and, we can, and they can't watch for example videos longer than uh, 15 to uh, 30 seconds uh, and I think uh, studies show, for example, that the social network activates areas linked to the sensation of pleasure and experts explain that uh, this quick result make, makes it difficult to change focus to a more complex activities and I think they are crucial to critical thinking and I am worried about that. Um, and uh, uh, gender sensitive pedagogy is mainly concerned with the inequalities and the symmetries that persist and the needs of students. Uh, and you mentioned men and women uh, in the classroom, and of course, you said today the outside the classroom <coughs> uh, context. Uh, um, but if you could elaborate more, because you mentioned other exclusions, other vulnerable groups. Um, and if you include in your project an intersectional perspective or not, if you pay attention to these uh, various identity belongings and how they intersect with the gender uh, dimension. Um, besides that, uh, whether it also looks at gender uh, beyond the binary perspective uh, or whether this has not been worked out. This is a concern I felt from uh, some colleagues uh, who still don't know how to deal, for example, with the transgender students or don't know how to approach these issues in the classroom. I don't know if you include that in your toolkit, in the materials that you produce during the project. Um, as I understand, uh, this approach also uh, was implemented in the African context in, for um, universities uh, in the African context. Can we apply uh, in the same way in the other context is a, a question for you. Um, is the, the fact of being attentive uh, to the needs of the students because it's a key point uh, of your project which are encountered in the field the way uh, of being a situated knowledge strategy. Um, how to pay attention to these cultural particularities uh, and the diversity of people that we have in our universities nowadays because of course nowadays we need to, to, to talk about gender but of course intersect with for example race, ethnicity uh, and other uh, dimensions. And uh, concerning gender spaces you identified you have language. Um, in the classroom and uh, for me uh, um, language is a key point because um, uh, and it's a key point uh, because it's one of the areas that we need in our daily lives um, uh, it's central because uh, it is through that language that we name the world but of course it's one of the topics when we are uh, trying to approach gender that creates more resistance in diverse contexts and maybe you can uh, say something about that from your experience because I don't know if you are uh, dealing with the inclusive language and uh, the dimensions that you work uh, including this perspective of the language. Um, even trainings, uh, the need uh, in these areas is of 
not recognized. Recently, in a session at a university, someone said that teachers don't like awareness raising sessions, uh, and that time is so and that the time is so scarce to participate in trainings. And when uh, these are not compulsory, uh, usually the same people show up. And uh, how to change this? Um, the effect of multipliers that you told us, uh, maybe it's lost uh, when we think about this, uh, this uh, topic. Uh, how we can change this? It's another thing from your presentation. And today, uh, during the morning session, we talked about narrow liberalism and in, and in the universities and we feel every day that it's a problem because often there is a no stable teaching staff due to the precariousness of higher education institutions and this also means that these practices cannot be implemented in a long term um, it is crucial to involve the organizational uh, leadership in this process and we talked about this about that how to include the leadership in this process, but how to uh, uh, create a, a long-term process when we are dealing with this precariousness uh, in our institutions. Um, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, it is possible to continue to improve this framework after the project, because you now you are not in these institutions and uh, if you have uh, news from these institutions and if they are working with the PR project and the tools that you create. And uh, uh, headed to this uh, stigma, um, headed to this, there is a stigma that still uh, exists about these issues. Gender, feminism, and in this room many people know about that because we are researching, we teach about these kind of topics. And we feel that in daily life in our higher uh, institutional um, places. Uh, and they are not often considered the key uh, issues within the scientific areas. When we work with the gender sensitive perspectives or have research projects uh, in these areas, there is an immediate discussion about being activists. Uh, and activism is still often considered negative in the academia, uh, even by the positivism paradigm uh, that still persists. So we, now I try to share some questions, some concerns here uh, with, from your presentation and from your project and uh, I want to thank you uh, again for sharing your, your experience, your project and for uh, your important work. Thank you so much.